Welcome to A Picture in a Thousand Words, brought to you by the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. In this series, we'll be breaking down some of the most iconic images of space from the perspective of an astronomer. That's me. My name is Mubdi Rahman, and I am a scientist at the Dunlap Institute. And in this series, we'll be going through a variety of some of the most beautiful and inspiring images that astronomy and space have to offer and breaking it down from the perspective of an astronomer. What do we see? And taking a look at some of the stories behind some of the images. If you're watching this live on YouTube, feel free to throw a couple of questions in the live chat, which I believe is somewhere around there. And we'll try to answer them at the end of the show. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the famous image of the Orion Nebula. So why don't we get started? So this is the Orion Nebula in its all its wonder and glory. Uh, many of you may have seen this image before. It This picture happens to be taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, so that's somewhere going up around us, and partially from a telescope in Chile. And the images are actually in colors that are similar to what your eyes can see, what we call the visible light spectrum. And this is, so the red over here, all that red that you're going to see, that is similar to the red that your eyes are sensitive to. The blue over there, that's going to be uh, blue that your eyes can see, and we've got a little bit of green going on over there. So this is all sort of the kind of light that you yourself would be able to see if you had massively sensitive eyes that you could just stare into space with. So this region, it's about 1500 light years away. And just as a sense, to give you a sense, a light year is the distance that light, which is the fastest thing in the universe, can travel within a year. For reference, it takes eight minutes for light from the sun to hit the Earth. And the furthest thing we've ever sent away from the Earth, the Voyager 2 spacecraft, that's about one light day away. So this is far. This is really, really far. But this is actually one of the closest regions that's like this, the one of the closest nebulae that's going on here. And just to give you a sense, this entire image is about half a degree in size. That is roughly the same size as the full moon. So if you were taking a look at the moon, that's what we'd see. As a side note, the moon actually seems fairly large to us, and part of that is because it's bright, and often when we're looking at it, we don't really have a lot of context, but it's actually kind of small in the sky. So if you ever tried to point your cell phone camera at it, you'll notice that it looks like a speck. Uh, half a degree isn't actually that large when it comes down to it, uh, but for, you know, in an astronomical context, it's actually a fairly wide area of the sky. And the basic idea behind the Orion Nebula, the way that you uh, try to, un the way that you can understand it is by thinking of it as a place where gas is coming from, uh, where gas is coming together and forming stars. So you can see all of this gas over here and all this gas here, and there's some other secret gas that you'll see in this image, and it's all coming together and forming new stars. And the critical thing to understand and to, the, to look at when it comes down to the Orion Nebula is this thing over here. This is what we call the trapezium star cluster. So break that down. That's actually a series, or um, in this case, four stars that are, were born together, and they're massive. It's a cluster of them that are all sort of you know, born at the same time. And we think that there are four stars there, but actually we know that there are six stars there in reality because two of those stars are what we call binaries. So that is when there you have two stars that are so close together and they're orbiting one another that they end up looking like one star. So those four stars are actually six and they're huge. They are, the biggest one is 30 times the mass of our sun. And let's Think about this for a second. So 30 times the mass of the biggest thing in our own solar system. That's all just in there in one of these stars. So we're talking about a lot of star going on there. 
And there's some rules that astronomers typically know. We, you know, stars generally behave in very similar ways. So one of the first things about stars is that the bigger the star is, typically, the brighter it is. So these stars are incredibly luminous. They're producing a ton of light. But you can say, you know, you can take a look at this image and be like, hey, this mostly looks dark. If this star, if these stars are so bright, why does it look so dark all the way around here? Why is there so much darkness that's going on? And the answer is that the vast majority of their light is in the ultraviolet. This is light that is bluer than your eyes can see, the same kind of ultraviolet light that the sun produces a bit of and is blocked by our ozone layer. So it's actually invisible to much of the optical, you know, much of your eyes, but it has a lot of energy. And that's where the mass, vast majority of the energy of these stars is coming out. It's just, you know, coming out in every which way in the ultraviolet. And that's heating up the, heating up the gas and it's blowing this massive bubble. What you see here is gas that's being pushed away and heated up because of all of this. Uh, because of all of the uh, all of the ultraviolet light that's coming out that way and it's so energetic. But there's a second thing we know about stars. We know that when there are a few big stars, and these are, you know, amongst the biggest stars that we know of, there are, you know, anytime, you know, the biggest one is 30 times the mass of our sun, there's usually a lot of smaller stars, right? And you can see a few here or there, but the question is, where are they, right? I can't see a ton of small stars on this image. We'll come back to that and just keep, you know, just keep a pin in that because the answer is kind of cool. Just to give you a sense, this region is about 300,000 years old. So that sounds like a long time. You know, I, I certainly am not 300,000 years old. No one I know is 300,000 years old. No one that was their grandfather's grandfather or grandmother is not 300,000 years old. We're talking about a long time ago, before humans, uh, before humans were human. And the challenge, however, is that 300,000 years old is actually not that old when it comes to stars. Just to give you a sense, our sun, it's about a middle-aged star, and it's about 5 billion years old. Whereas these stars all the way in here, they are just 300,000 years old. The sun will live to about another 5 billion years. So this is a very young region, and this is you know, this is why we think and we know that this is where stars are being born right now. So we can ask the question, what's happening to all the energy that's produced in this region? And it's being shot out from every which way, and it's hitting other gas along the way. And so we have all of this red stuff over here. What's going on there is this light is hitting this hydrogen gas. Most of the gas that you're seeing in this is hydrogen, and it's turning it into a plasma. This plasma produces the color of hydrogen light, and that is the red. And so what you're seeing all along here is hydrogen gas that has been lit up by these stars in the center. So we can also ask the question, so if that's red, why is this stuff white? Well, imagine you're really close to something really bright and they're, they are incredibly hot and it's producing a lot of light. A lot of that light is hitting all the gas around you and just reflecting and scattering off. So this is equivalent to when a star uh, or when you turn on your fog lights, when you turn on your fog lights in the fog, or sorry, not in your fog lights, your high beams in the fog, and basically everything just starts to shine. Everything is, you know, all the light is bouncing around, and that's why it looks so very, very white. But we also see these kind of dark bands around here. So you can see some over here, you can see some over here, and you can see some over there. And one of the 
cool things about it is typically in space, when you see darkness, you expect it to be just this massive void that it goes on and there's nothing between you and it. And that's the exact opposite of what's going on here. These dark bands are actually filled with large amounts of gas. How much gas? So much gas that they're blocking all the light that's coming, that's coming in here and it's being absorbed. And when I talk about gas, don't think about like the atmosphere outside. Think about smoke. It's the consistency and the darkness of smoke and soot. And so what we're seeing there is basically all the light being blocked. In fact, what this area is here versus out there where you don't see much of the red is that this area is where the bubble has started to pop and it's starting to reveal what's going on on the inside. Here, it hasn't popped yet. All that gas has been pushed together and it's hiding everything. So I want to point out some of these structures. So we see this trapezium star cluster. We see a bunch of these kinds of structures you know, these massive wings around here. But let's take a look at it now, not in light that, you know, visible light, not that light that you and I can see, but more so what's known as infrared light. So this is light that is redder than red. And this is basically the same picture taken now with the Spitzer Space Telescope. So that's also somewhere around here, but unfortunately it's no longer in operation. And it was a telescope that looked at infrared light. So that's light that's redder than red. And this is more light that uh, a snake would be able to see. So if you imagine a massive python with huge sensitive eyes that was staring out into space, this is kind of what they'd see. And that is a disturbing thought. Uh, I, yeah, we don't need those massive space pythons anywhere. But you can see the same structure. You can still see all of those you know, all of the stars from the trapezium, you can see that, you know, shell, you can see those wings, you can see all of this. But in addition now, what we're seeing is all of these little green spots. Remember how I said that when there are big stars, these ones over here, there are usually a lot of really small stars that are being born with it. That's where they are. The visible light was being blocked out because there's so much gas in this region. And so the light from these new stars that are being born that are much closer to, say, the size of the sun, you weren't able to see them in the visible light. You can only really see them in the infrared light because your that light can travel through the gas. But the other thing that we're starting to see here is all of these glowing molecules. Right, so the red that's in this picture, and so this remember, this is not true red. This is not the kind of red that your eyes would be able to see. This is the red that a snake would be able to see. And this is all, again, molecules. So all of that light that's coming from the trapezium cluster in there, it's bouncing off of the gas. And so it's turning the hydrogen into a plasma, but it's also heating up all the molecules that are in that gas that are mixed together. There's not as many as you know molecules as there are things like hydrogen or things like helium, but it's bouncing around and heating them up a bit. And what we're seeing here is just where all of those molecules are. And we can see some fine structures. And the cool thing about infrared is because it's not as easily absorbed, we can penetrate deeper into this region, into this nebula, and see some of the interesting things that are happening as stars are being born. So it's kind of cool. But one of the things I mentioned right at the beginning off the top is this is one of the brightest nebula that we can see. So where can you see it? So this is a picture of Orion. This is just taken with a normal camera, standard DSLR, for those of you who are interested, in New Mexico. And this is the constellation Orion, or most of the constellation Orion, right over there, you know, pinning all these spots. Most of you in the Northern Hemisphere, usually in the winter, can probably see this pretty easily. And the way that you can typically tell is taking a look at these three stars that are Orion's belt. We call them Orion's belt because essentially this is kind of Orion. His head would be over here, you know, legs would be somewhere down there. Uh, and there are more stars that connect all the constellation. And so therefore, this is his belt. And with Apologies to Mr. Will Smith from Men in Black. 
there are actually a lot of galaxies along Orion's belt, but we'll come back to that in a future episode. But if you follow along Orion's belt and take a look at basically his dagger, what you see there are a set of three stars in this bright fuzzy object. That bright fuzzy object over there, people can see with their naked eyes. You don't need a telescope, you don't need any special camera. If you're in a dark enough place, you can just take a look at the sky and see something that looks like a patch of fuzz. In fact, that patch of fuzz, the reason it's a fuzzy object, that is the reason why these things are called nebula. That's essentially what nebula means, fuzzy object. And so people have been seeing this since the 17th century. But the cool thing about it is that this is one of the first regions that really helped us connect that new form stars are being are associated with this fuzziness, with this gas that's glowing, and really helped astronomers piece together what uh, what happens when stars are being born and sort of helped us unlock those mysteries. And that's what we're starting to see. So just taking a look at the chat, there's a couple of questions. So we talked a little bit about the different colors, but some of these, uh, in some of these images, you are seeing blue dots uh, around, and some of those are actually basically blue giants. So Isabella, you are correct. You are seeing these different stars that are of different types. And when we're talking about a blue giant, that's basically a fairly young star that is, that is very hot. In fact, the blue that you're seeing is probably not where the most of its light's coming from. Most of its light is in the ultraviolet. In fact, those stars, those white stars that you saw in the trapezium, so uh, they are somewhere in there, we're not zoomed in, those are actually also blue just because there's just a lot of dust in between them and the red light gets trapped more easily. And so that's why they don't look as blue as they would if there was no dust between us. But thank you very much. That's uh, that's all we got for today. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, especially on YouTube. For those of you who are following along on YouTube, we have another program at the Dunlap Institute called Cosmo from Your Couch, and that's an opportunity for you to get deeper into astronomy with one of the researchers at the Dunlap Institute. So definitely pay attention to that. Uh, one thing that I'd definitely love for you to do, this is a new series, so please feel free to leave comments uh, in the in the comment section or in the side where the live chat's going on. And please recommend future pictures that you want us to kind of dive into in a more deep way. Until next time, this is a picture in a thousand words. Thank you very much.